you much for um, inviting me uh, to, to speak um, on behalf of ECMWS. Um, this, I'm presenting the work of uh, many, many people. Uh, some of them are, are online and following this uh, workshop. Um, I, when I proposed the title uh, for this presentation, Julian uh, also asked, oh, by the way, how is your data, cen uh, data center and archive migration to, to Bologna? So, so I, 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 in the end, we, we also added a little bit of information here of what we are doing because it's, it's quite an undertaking and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just give you some, some pointers of what we're doing. Um, so I'll, I'll be talking about Exascale I.O. challenges and, and, and some of you may have seen this, this material before. It is uh, a lot of it uh, related to this uh, presentation that Adrian Jackson did this morning. In, in, in the work we did together with um, with them in the uh, next Gen IO project. It is not o now over, but as Adrian said, the prototype is available for people to um, um, apply to, to do some research on it. Okay, so ECMWS um, has some severe Exascale IO challenges. And uh, before we go further, let me just quickly say uh, who is ECMWS for those who do not know. Uh, ECMWS is a weather forecasting uh, center, European weather center, if you want to use the short term name. Um, what we do is uh, medium range weather forecasting. We have uh, uh, member states um, from all over Europe uh, in cooperating states. Um, um, and we run a 24 7 operational service. Uh, and four times a day, we produce weather forecasts for the whole world, so global weather forecasts. And um, aside from that, we also do a lot of research into improving our systems, and we also operate two of the Copernicus uh, European Union services, Climate Change and Atmospheric Monitor Service. And we are also working in uh, support of the Copernicus Emergency Management Service, uh, namely with flood forecasting. Um, as I alluded to, we will be moving our data center, whereas currently in the UK, we are going to move it towards, uh, um, it's currently in UK, Shinfields Park, we're going to move it to uh, Bologna, and, um, and this is happening uh, uh, as we speak. The data center is being built, uh, an HPC has been, a new HPC has been procured, it will be installed, it will be installed towards the end of this year. Um, and. Um, Happily, with this COVID uh, situation, we didn't have many delays in the data center because of the COVID. Um, if we want to talk about exascale uh, challenges, it's useful to understand the flow that it seems has, because that flow is at the basis of all our um, issues and challenges and difficulties. Okay? Um, we take observations from. Um, uh, can you see my 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 mouse, my pointer? Yes. Okay. So we 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 get observations from the globe, um, weather observations sat, uh, from satellites, balloons, uh, air, aircraft, etc. We do an, an acquisition of that data. We prepare the data and, and do. Uh, a minimization to create the initial condi the initial conditions for uh, the the model, and then we run a, 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 a weather model uh, and we forecast the, day, the, the the weather for 14 days uh, ahead. After that, the model produces uh, uh, the output, which goes to Luster, uh, part of a system inside the HPC, and from we do product generation, and from product generation we push it to product dissemination, which makes sure that those products reach uh, our member states and, and customers around the world. Okay. On the side, we also take all those observations and fields created from the model, and we put it on a perpetual archive that we call Mars. So if we want to look at the pain point of this workflow, we can, we can zoom in and see the interaction between the IFS model and the product generation. And we see that the IFS model writes its fields to the parallel file system. The product generation reads those fields. And the product generation reads about 70% of the, all the data the IFS writes to, to that parallel file system. 
And this is happening at the same time as the, pro the model is running. We have one hour of time critical window to generate the forecast and create the products and disseminate them to our member states and clients. So this interaction of the producer of data and consumer of the data simultaneously accessing the, the parallel file system really puts a very, very big um, demand on, on, on current parallel file systems, okay? Um, and and I think this is, is, is something uh, that other centers have found out, that workflows like this, producer-consumer, simultaneous producer-consumer workflows, um, when you're producing data and reading data at the same time, um, and, and within the space of minutes, um, this, this tends to be a, a pain point, okay? On the side, we have also to, to archive. Um, if we take the current operational forecast, the current software, the whole pipeline, and we move it to the next operational uh, resolution that we would like. So today we, we run nine kilometer resolution, but 18 kilometers for the ensemble. So these are 50, 50 uh, simultaneous simulations at the same time to create a probabilistic, probabilistic spread. We use the nine kilometer resolution, which we can't afford today. We, we hope to afford on the next supercomputer. Without IO, we take an amount of time. So 5,700 seconds. If we just turn on the IO of the operational, files, uh, 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 operational system, we increase 7% the runtime just to write the amount of data. So we produce roughly 100 terabytes of data within these four bursts of one hour per, per day. 17% is added. If we, at the same time, add the running on different nodes, of course, nobody's sharing here the, the computational resource, the, the product generation that reads that data, that is only being, the only resource that is shared is the network and the parallel system, we see that the, I, the model is slowed down even further, up to 20%. So this means that there is an interaction by the contention through the file system. We are coupling the two uh, runs via the file system. And this is making it that it's, it's, we are going beyond this one hour window that we have for running our, our operational forecast. And the reason this is that if we take the view of the data, it is becoming central and everything we do from acquiring observations, producing products, updating those products, archiving and disseminating data, it all goes through the parallel file system. So we, are, we have a strong choke point. However, it is also an opportunity because if all goes there and we make that faster, then we can do a, a significant improvement. Um, but this is getting worse because we are forecasting or over the history of ECMDLF, we have had a 40% year-on-year increase, compound increase of the data sizes, okay? So the, today we produce, depending on how you count, so roughly 100 terabytes, 70 of which are for the ensemble. You can see it here on the, the plot on the, on the right. We forecast that it should have happened uh, this year. It's probably going to happen only at the beginning of next year. We will move to the next uh, HPC system where we'll have, an, instead of producing 70 terabytes on the ensemble, we'll produce nearly 300 terabytes, okay? So this is the, the, uh, a huge exponential growth that we have seen in, over the last 20 years, and it's, there's, we don't see any, any slowdown on that. So we need to be prepared for when we reach a very, very high resolution, we're talking about kilometer resolution, um, how can our IO systems cope? For example, just to give you an idea, a one kilometer resolution uh, grid um, would take just one single field. So one, one field is a slice, a 2D slice of the atmosphere, if you want, for one single, level, say temperature. At one mit, uh, kilometer, 1.25 kilometer resolution, that would be, in memory, nearly two gigabytes of data, okay? So we are today here. We are today at nine kilometers. We would like to go to five kilometers for the next uh, resolution increase, but 
really, we are looking and trying to solve this problem of the exascale. How can we do data of this density, right? And this, for example, is such a picture. We can already produce this. The, the model computation power is there, not to do it within one hour, but we can already do it. So, for example, at, at this very moment, we are running stimulations on Summit, and we are running it at one kilometer resolution, and this is what you obtain. The advantage of this is that this is a, uh, a weather simulation where you don't need to do parameterization for for convection, for example. You don't you do not need that. So you you model uh, um, what does it mean it, you, that you model um, humidity in the air and clouds appear by themselves. Okay, you don't have to parameterize the cloud. You don't have to parameterize how convection happens, and 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 that is very very promising for for the future. But we need to be able to handle this. Today, we cannot even post-process this data. And this is mainly an I.O. issue. So how do we tackle this? We were involved in this uh, next I.O. project. At the very beginning, if we would say, how can we do a 50 ensemble forecast at one kilometer? You can do a back of the envelope calculations. This is again, my, one of my favorite uh, means of computation. Um, and you can work it out that with all the resolution inputs, um, you go from one, simu one single simulation taking 21 terabytes. Remember, we have to do four per day, but one single one is 21 terabytes. And you need, and you arrive to needing basically 3.6 terabytes of data to arrive to a 50 member ensemble at one kilometer. Yes, that means 3.6 petabytes of data in one hour, okay? It's not for today, but one day we want to arrive there. So how do we solve that? The next in our projects, we, and Adrian, I'm not going to spend a lot of time because Adrian this morning presented this very well. We got access to this special hardware where we're using NVRAM. Now for, for ECMWS, this NVRAM is not very interesting from the fact that it's non-volatile. What's very interesting for us is that NVRAM is very dense, very dense memory. One single of these in, that, in this next NAO project has three terabytes of addressable memory, right? This for us is a big game change because now I can store all my outputs of the model and do immediate product generation without having to hit the, the parallel file system. And in this prototype, you have 34 of those, so you get, you get 200 terabytes of data very easily. So, is that useful? Well, as Adrian this morning presented, that means you need to change the software, because you need to make sure, you need to use this, this, uh, this uh, architecture, okay? So, to, you, to do that, at the, be, at the beginning of this project, we embarked in the rewriting what is for us the STV fields database. It's a domain-specific distributed object store. We rewrote it from scratch. Um, me and my colleague, Simon Smart, that, has, that is uh, also in this um, presentation, uh, in this workshop, um, we rewrote it to be transactional without any synchronization. It's basically a key value store where the data that is stored inside are these particular um, grid messages from meteorology, but it's in there with scientific metadata. So you can say this is temperature. This is the this uh, date. This is the forecast for that uh, that date with this step, with this hour, etc. And we index all that, and we separate that from the backends. And the backends can be NVRAM. We are working on a backend for Ceph. We we hope to work with the uh, Sci uh, in Sage two to for a backend on Miro. And we first thing we did was implement the backend on POSIX cluster file system because we still want to support our current operational system. The properties of this uh, software is that it's, well, ACID, transactional. Um, we write the blocks uh, in, in a synchronous manner, ma manner, so we give the data, we hand it, uh, and we only flush when and make it consistent and available for the readers on particular moments of the forecast. This is, con this is convenient for us because the forecast has steps. So once a step is finished, I we flush everything, that means that the reader can pick it up. 
We don't, we write once, we never overwrite, meaning that the data bill is immutable and the data gets masked. If you rewrite the same data with the same metadata, it's basically like a version system. You can go, you can, you can even roll back and get the previous one. The advantage is that we, we distribute all servers using a rendezvous hashing, so there is no need to synchronize. And uh, each client talks directly to the server it needs to, to talk, no extra communications required. We also were very careful in designing this API such that there is a front end API that is super simple, archive, pass the metadata, this is my buffer, this is the size, right, and retrieve as the reverse, and of course you need the flush to make it consistent. Um, it's also runtime configurable, you can manage pools, you can do all sorts of policies. And the important thing is that it's all access to the same language that has been used at ECM Development for the last 30 years, which is called the Mars language, but it's in, in, essentially is a dictionary that describes our data. It goes in and the, our scientists understand this dictionary and this, therefore they can talk with the system in scientific uh, semantic terms that we understand and we are going to uh, translate to get the object that is correct and return to them. Moreover, we, when they took uh, um, the concept of data routing, okay, so by, by carefully designing the, the API to be composable, have an API for different selection of, of, of routes, for example, if you say that the data is operational, we can reroute it to a different place than if the data is for uh, research experiments. Um, we, we implemented a, di a distribution mechanism using the rendezvous hashing. We made it that uh, can be either local or remote, but that is independent if it, of the selection algorithm. And, and then we implemented the different backends. And all this is composable uh, parts that you, you can build for your own site. So we have now been uh, working, for example, with LRZ to, de to deploy with, in their site and it to be very different than, than what is deployed at ECM Web. And by the way, just that we're uh, mentioning, FDB5 is an open source project that was open sourced at the end of the NextGenAO project. Um, I'm not going to go into very deep details. This is just a, one of the uh, architectural slides just to show that there's a, a lot of care taken over in terms of how to make uh, the right synchronous, how to make sure that you have a consistency, um, and how to, to make sure that we are never throttled by uh, queues. So, so there's always different queues, both on the client, both on the server. Data is always in flight until the moment that you say flush, right? And we took that and we actually made it operational. So in the 11th of June of last year, we brought this software before the end of the European project. We brought this software into operations at ATM the web. And of course, today, it's on operations based on the last file system backend, of course. And a uh, uh, funny anecdotal story is that both me and Simon, the developers of the software, were on an, in an airplane when it went operational. So our, our, our friends in operations were a bit um, nervous that uh, we, were, we, were, we actually were going together to a conference on the same day that, uh, that uh, this was going live. But here you are, you can see that in the first day, 100 terabytes were written, and this is a, a little summary of what was done in that day. Okay, how do we did how do we benchmark this for for um, NextGen IO? We took the NextGen IO cluster, we um, created uh, um, something that models the IO of the IFS. Um, the cluster has 34 nodes, so it's, if we would run the real operational uh, um, model there, we didn't have enough, enough computational power to simulate 50 ensembles, okay? But we can make um, um, some, some prototype uh, uh, mini, mini model, if you want, um, where we generate data as fast as we can, but still with the same data pattern I, would be IF, our IFS model doing it. And then we distribute that across all the nodes. Similarly, we don't dedicate nodes for I.O. We say, okay, all the nodes are also I.O. servers. So we have this approach that everybody writes to everybody. And
on a, on a real production run. This is not an IOR or a, or a, or a IO500 benchmark uh, because it's very specific to meteorology. And, and so bear in mind, of course, these results are only applicable for this application, right? But it's application measured. It's not uh, measured in the IO sense. So if you look at the per per parallel performance of this FDB5, the right performance when we wrote uh, from varying from 2 to 4 to 8 to 16 nodes, we got to up to 72 gigabytes per second of write performance. Okay? Um, this varies, of course, with the number of writer, of writer process, processes. So you have to have enough producers of data to dump the data. Um, this, of course, also with the number of server nodes to absorb that data. And of course, it depends also a lot on the network. So in this particular uh, system, we had a pretty good network. Um, but what is most interesting is that if when we are running this, these um, benchmarks, we go in to, the, to each node and we inspect the queues, and very often the queues are, are nearly empty or one or two items or object slides. So that means that the underlying hardware for, for the DCPMM devices are happily uh, taking in the, 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 the I.O. It is mostly the, the limitation that we believe at the moment they are on the software level. They are on the application generating the, the, the data and they are, and they are on, the, on the, um, the network maybe. Remember, all this is application level code. So includes flushes, includes every step simulating a forecast and every step calling a flush to ensure consistency, okay? The same thing if you run the benchmark for read performance, we, we obtain slightly le less uh, perform performance uh, because, of course, when you the, remember, this, we have an indexing scheme. We talk, we request the data always in scientific terms, give me temperature, give me the forecast hour three, and we have to find. So there is a data lookup in the indexes. So to obtain the data, this, it's usually less of a, a, a slightly less uh, uh, performance. And we obtain about 60 gigabytes per second. Um, but the most interesting thing is that we took this, uh, this, uh, this uh, prototype of Nexon IO and we ported IFS there, the full model, and we were able to fit six ensemble members, okay? So with six ensemble members and a, and a local uh, luster file system that uh, he, um, our colleagues in Edinburgh kindly uh, made available, we ran the model with I.O. and the product generation. And, of course, with luster, you can see we went from 1,793 seconds to 1,928 seconds of runtime just by adding the product generation. That's the same thing as we were observing before. At, in our center. But if we use the distributed object store with on top of the NVDIMs, this is what we get. Not only the IO is, is faster, that's expected, 1,600, uh, the model is faster because it doesn't wait for IO, 1,610 seconds. But when you run with product generation and you add that contention, reading and writing at the same time, you don't see any effect. In fact, we even measure that faster, but okay, that's within the, the noise of the measurement. But it's basically the same. This line is, is basically the same timing. So the advantage of this non-volatile system is that you can read and write at the same time without affecting the, 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 the readers, affecting the, the writers, which means this is perfect for complex workflows where you have multiple readers and writers simultaneously wanting to access that resource. So some, these were basically preliminary results. We are just beginning this, this, this uh, um, journey, if you want. Um, but I'm not trying to argue against Luster and parallel file systems. I think they will still stay around for very long and, 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 and they have a future. But this is not the same thing, right? A parallel file system for, for me right now is basically like a big lorry, a capacity system, right? You want lots of this space, four petabytes. This is our, by the way, the configuration of our current operational file system, right? We have four petabytes of capacity. Measured IOR, 165 gigabytes per second. Really? An application measured 
we see basically 22 gigabytes per second read and write on a good day, okay? This is when we don't have problems. So aggregate 45 gigabytes per second, right? Next gen IO, in next gen IO, with just 34 nodes, three terabytes per node, 100 terabytes of capacity, yes, lower capacity, without optimizing the code, we got to 72 gigabytes per second of write performance on thin nodes, right? So there's a big, big difference. These are different hardware, so different usages. I, 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 I would like you to really think of them as different usages. So going back to our level calculation, can we do that 1.25 gigabytes, uh, 25 kilometer and some forecast? I think I can, because now I, I look at those 3.6 bytes that I need to do in one single hour. Remember, I need to do also to read 70% of it. So I need to actually handle 6.2 petabytes. Um, and the time to solution, it's 3,600 seconds. So I need really a performance 1.8, uh, sorry, uh, 1,800 gigabytes per second. Now, 16 nodes of uh, next gen IO performance give me 132 gigabytes per second. Here is the read and the write together, right? I'm doing a bit of uh, assumptions here that read and write together 72, 52, plus 60 gives me uh, 170, uh, 132. But if I do that, that tells me that if, I, if, if my solution scales, I would just need, just between quotes, 213 nodes of the next IO performance to do this 6.7 petabytes an hour. And that is my objective of, to reach in 2035, okay? So I think that this is a, this technology, this slide is to show you that this technology does have a future. It has a future because it will allow us to go further. It will allow us to do the things that we can, all, we can only imagine, right? But further on, we are starting to see other uses for this uh, for this uh, uh, hardware. We believe that we will put this hardware in some kind of central place where we can build on this FTP data per cubes that allow not only the parallel file system, the, the, the sorry, the producers to produce the data, retri retrievers and, and, and product generations to come and do their, their business, but also serve at the same time analytic, data analytic and machine learning type of consumers that typically don't access the data in the same way, uh, in the same predictable way that say our product generation does. And they want to come and access it in different axes, for example, time series or access through vertical levels. And our, currently in a parallel, in the current parallel system, this data would be collocated in, in ways that I would, this would be ex, extremely inefficient. So we believe that this data, this, uh, sorry, this um, technology, because it's byte addressable, will allow us to provide a central location for our data that makes the dealing between producers and consumers much, much easier. And therefore, unpredictable, um, algorithms that live in the cloud can access our data. And that leads us to an, a, a new development that is coming up. I'm not going to present it today. I'm close to the end of my presentation. But just to let you know, ECMWF is working on solving the problem of sharing data between HPC and cloud. I think this technology will be useful for it, but we also need to bring in the software. And the idea is to we, we are working, there's a, there's a project called European Weather. We are creating a cloud in premises next to our HPC where we don't, we don't want to compete with Amazon or Google. And, uh, those clouds will be much better than ours in terms of processing power. But to, to have privileged access to our data, because we produce, say today, hundreds of data and we can't push it everywhere, if you want to access high, uh, high resolution our data, you will come in to our cloud, and this is what we are calling data as a service, and you be close to our data and access not only the, the, the real-time data in the FB5, but even, even the, the archive, 
and you can do your post processing close to us you know and and therefore but still in your vms in your in your own work uh, uh, control space and and profit from uh, the performances that we have just seen so watch this space it's called polytope and uh, in, maybe next time we have a a, a, a cigio um, workshop we will be presenting that okay uh, so messages to take home um, ensemble data sets are growing quadratically and we do need to look at these new technologies of NVRAM and storage class memories to keep up with it. We are changing our workflow to take advantage of this. And um, we, are def we developed a, a distributed object store that is open source for weather and climate. And uh, we are definitely working now to serve these data sets out of the PC into data analytics platforms and, and the cloud. So uh, Julian promised me to uh, um, asked me to promise to say something about the data center. So how about that move of the data center? So I'm not going to take a lot of time, but if you are curious, we, we are going to do a big, big change, which is we're going to move our data center to Bologna, right? And why is that a problem? Why is that a challenge? Well, if you look at our back to our workflow, we read, we get 200 gigabytes per day of global observations. The IFS model writes about 100 terabytes of operational data per day, of which we, we need uh, seven terabytes. Actually, this, these positions are, these arrows are in the wrong position. Um, and we eventually disseminate to our clients 30 terabytes per day. However, on the side, because of our uh, workloads, additional workloads, we send to our archives 250 terabytes per day. That means every four days, our archive increases by one petabyte. So how do you move a 24-7 uh, data center? We need to run this weather forecast four times per day. We still need to produce 100 terabytes per day, every day. This, we cannot stop the, the weather forecast. One thing is easy, is actually we can obtain a new HPC and install it directly in Bologna, in Italy, in place and keep our HPC running. However, we do not have budget to have two data handling systems. The handling system is where we keep all our archives, okay? Uh, it has, it's composed of disks, servers, and an and HPS tape library, which stores today 350 petabytes and growing at one petabyte every four days. And even if we could afford a second system in Bologna, how would we transfer, right? I mean. 350 petabytes at 100 gigabit uh, uh, network, that's still 339 days to transfer. And that's if all the data is, 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 if the network is the bottleneck, which is, it isn't. The real bottleneck is the tapes. At 300, 300 terabyte of tape access, that's nearly 1,200 days just to, to get the data read out of the tape system. So we cannot do that. And all of you are going to say, well, obviously, you're going to move it in a lorry, put the, the, all the tapes into a lorry, and transfer it to Bologna. And sure, we are going to do that. But that puts a problem. We don't have two op data handling systems. How are we going to do that while still moving, uh, st still producing all our forecasts and having minimal, in minimal impact? Well, let's have a little code digression, OK? How do you do? A multi-threaded transactional swap. Okay, you have a piece of code. You have a S as a variable standing for Shinfo. You assign it 350. Uh, you have Bologna that starts with zero. And if you want to do that um, that swap, you first you lock the variables, right? You do the in a multi-threaded environment where you have multi users accessing. You you do the swap with a temporary system. And uh, you then you unlock, and then you can clean the temporary system. I mean, I'm I'm pretty sure all of you know this very well. I'm just making this the case to help you explain what comes on the next slide. We are going to go through um, dark archive periods. So we are going to have the current operational files, uh, operational data handling system operational until today. That's the blue line. On that day, we. Stop the archive access, 
and we start flushing everything we have on the disk cache to take. We expect that to take about maybe four days. And uh, after that, we stop all the systems and we are going to transfer the HPSS databases directly to, to Bologna. That's easy because that's not a lot. That's just a database part, the indexing system. But what we need is to create a temporary system, okay? We need this temporary system that will hold the copy of all the read data that we need for that dark period, okay? Moreover, this is operational data that we have today here in operations in the, in the archive, but cannot go dark. This data has to exist. For example, observations for our researchers to continue doing their work. Um, and on the side, we are going to still create new data. So where do you put that data? We are going to store a temporary master copy that's going to wait for also a, a, this, this period, this dark period. And once we have moved all the, the data in Loris to, um, all the tapes in Loris to, to Bologna, we bring back up the system in Bologna and we do what we call back archive. We are going to take this temporary master put it back into the, into the main master that we just moved by, by Lori. And this will take some, some days, we estimate. And after, after which the data handle system will be fully loaded. Um, so we, ex we estimate that this archive dark period will be about six days. And so D plus six. And uh, from D plus six, when we are back online in Bologna, and, but we have empty disks and empty tapes, we slowly back our cut, and after probably 28 days, we should be back to fully operational and every, every day available um, for, uh, for the, our researchers. Okay, so that's my presentation. Thank you very much. And uh, do you have any questions? I'm free to answer them. Thank you. It was really interesting. Um, so you basically get a 10x speed up, right? Because otherwise, when you use 100 gigabit, it would be 330 days or something. You said, Tiago? Sorry, what was the question? Sorry? Oh, no, no, it was, it was just an observation. You get a 10x speed up in terms of data transfer, right? That's what I'm saying. To get the data back up it was 330 uh, days was 100 gigabit and now you're saying it's done in basically no, 30 days no 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 don't no 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 these are different things this would be an hypothetical transfer over the network ignore yes, that I know. yes and uh, this this is not that not this is not that the tapes are never going to be read they are just going to be mounted again in the in a new yes. library in bologna these six to 28 days are to back archive this data that was meanwhile produced when the date, the dark period. So if you, if you, if you think about it, if we produce around 100 terabytes per day, but that's only operational, we'd actually produce uh, uh, archive, we'd normally archive 200 terabytes per day. So that in this dark period here, we may have six times um, uh, 1.5 petabytes, right? So this is 1.5 petabytes that we need to bring back into the archive during this back archive period. However, during the back archive period, we have, we have already resumed normal operations. So the system will be fully, in, fully used. So we cannot use the whole yeah. throughput of the system for the back archive. So we can like, uh, we, we estimate it will be, take, of course, more than six days. It will take um, much more. How long do you expect to actually, uh, does it take once the lorries arrive until, you know, all the tapes are in place inside the libraries and everything works as before? That is, that is part of these 28 days. So yeah, 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 I understand. You can't, you can't put uh, the, all the dates, the, the, the tapes immediately in the, in the tape library, yeah. right? And so this is a manual work, of course, involving people that, that will be there in Bologna. And uh, so, so that is included in this, in this uh, D plus 28. 
then I would still say, right, you do it 10 times faster than going over a 100 um, gigabit because it's 28 yeah, yeah, days. Uh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, 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 exactly. Oh, wait, if you, and if you count the two days to drive the lorry, it's even faster. Right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. 